Next topic, Tom, I believe, is to talk about today's meeting. Exactly. All right. So um, I'd like to spend some time, I know it's get sort of getting late in the day, about areas that we might want to direct staff to narrow uh, recommendations based on what we've heard today. There are recommendations at the end of the, there's more, there's pretty specific recommendations at the end of the staff memo that um, are grouped basically according to the uh, panels. Um, I don't know if people have, specific, if I should just kind of read them off and if people want to react to them or if there are others, let, let me do that actually. Um, so just talking about the um, crime prevention and response, um, th there's a proposal to continue to support the state violence intervention efforts. I think that we, you know, th those are good. I just don't, I, I, I'm lacking clarity on like exactly how we could make a penal code recommendation that would, would do that. I don't know, Tom, if you have any thought there, if that's just like, we should look into it. Well, I think um, this is a way of continuing to address CalVIP, which is the program in the penal code. And it, it would, you know, CalVIP has changed sort of a lot, you know, every, every few years, not changed a lot, but it's changed every few years and it adds up to a lot of changes. Um, and one of the things we heard this morning and that that Rick especially heard in, in sort of the preparation for this meeting is that uh, CalVIP's capacity to do more sort of this idea you asked Ari about like who's in charge of statewide you know that could be specified in the penal code directly um so that that was a little bit of the idea there is to try to create that permanent kind of vision for the state um but you know again maybe it's not that's not specific enough or appropriate for the committee i think this i think at this stage is where for me at least it's not there's not enough flesh on the bones I'm, you know, open to um, hearing more if you guys can come up with further thoughts, or I don't know if other committee members have thoughts on this specific idea. I think, I I don't know, it's having a, a statewide, whatever, coordinator is what, but I think perhaps, um, like was pointed out, you've got, you have uh, the BSCC, distributing some of the funds under CalVIP. I think there's a couple, there may be one or two other entities. I think some clarity in terms of uh, the criteria for distributing CalVIP funds. Um, uh, you know, the whole evidence-based um, comes to mind, but uh, um, And maybe it's it's maybe it's evaluation. Maybe there needs to be an evaluation of the effort so far because we have we started to increase the funding to CalVIP very significantly about at least four years ago. And um, it'd be worth it to see what uh, what if any impacts. It could have even been uh, more than four years that we have been you know, dramatically increasing the funds. All right, well, I, I think we're gonna put this back to you guys staff is to see if you can put some sort of meat on this this idea. Yeah. Uh, the, we go uh, ahead, Mike. Sorry. That, that's it. <laughs> yeah. I mean there's always it's why I asked um uh, Reagan was her name. I asked her about, you know, did we have any indication that the states that had, say, a statewide coordinator were better? I mean, I think we're, we as a state have better stats around gun violence, though clearly um, we still have, uh, there's pockets in the state that where gun violence is, is uh, well, it's gone down, it's not, you know, it's still quite um, problematic. And um, whatever. So we, it seems to me we want to use our funds effectively. All right. So we'll, we'll, we'll go back to the some of the folks we spoke with today and, and boil it down. 
we'll follow up on that one. And, and, and we don't need to have a recommendation. You know, if we can't if we can't figure out a way that we can make right. some significant contribution, you know, like that that's okay. But if there's all right, you get the idea. Next, yeah. next, next, next bullet. Is there a page number on this so we can all follow along? I don't see it, but it's at the end of the memo. Second to last page of the memo. Pages back and say. Sort of this portion of it. Anyhow, I'm moving on. Um, establish a prosecution led diversion program for gun possession offenses. Um, I think that there was some positive reaction to this. It's not, it's not prohibited right now. Counties can and could theoretically do it. Doesn't seem like anybody is really doing it. Um, might as well follow other types of diversion type programs. Um, they seem uh, effective, again, in the wheelhouse of improving outcomes and reducing incarceration. I think it has our name on it. Uh, Mike, are you? I just I'm looking at that page. What, which recommendation are you looking at right now? This is the second bullet point. It says establish prosecution. You're led. Pros okay. It's page 22. It's the right. like you said, the second it. last page. Yeah. So the the idea is um, something akin. The the very is you participate and complete one of these um, violence prevention programs that would you'd be directed to that in lieu of incarceration or some sort of conviction just like we have in mental health treatment and other area dui just seems like another area right for diversion um with 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 ex with appropriate public safety exclusions and i like it one, yeah one, if this might be too in the weeds but i think the, the diversion programs that a lot of the panelists talked about were sort of the, the low hanging fruit, people who just forgot to send in their check to register and that sort of thing. But if we're, if really our focus is violence prevention, it seems like we should be doing those programs with the people they identify as most likely to, to engage in violence. Even, you know, maybe it's not diversion in lieu of some sort of criminal consequence, but, but that feels like if violence prevention is the goal, the place to be spending those those dollars um and we didn't really we didn't really get into a recommendation on who we would identify for that sort of program but i would push us to think about if we do have this ability to identify the people most likely to engage in violence that those dollars or programs are directed at them yeah i i agree because the data i've seen is where we have the most results is and when it's a very targeted and and correct me if I'm getting the recommendation wrong. This is this is kind of like the legislation we have this year from the committee, where the law doesn't explicitly say this or prohibit this. So making it clear that you can do this, um, the funding is kind of just uh, through through CalVIP is like the way it should be paired and wishful thinking. But that is the actual recommendation would be to clarify for the law that prosecutors can use diversion alternatives for misdemeanor gun possessions. Is that right? Y yes. Um, and I, and the reason to do that, it's not just that it's not prohibited. It looks like some places are explicitly saying, even though a lot of gun possession is a misdemeanor and we have general misdemeanor diversion, we're not ever going to let you do it. Like it's, you know, saying the quiet part out loud, I guess a little bit for some of it. So being a little more directive about it. And I think the Calvit piece, um, it was just saying this would be something CalVIP could find. They have a pretty strict list of, of the things they found, but you know that is sort of a, a secondary idea as, as a piece of it, because um, the programs that uh, uh, Mike McLively from Gifford talked about, um, it's pretty intense. You know, it, it was many tens of hours of counseling and, and things like that, but it was run by a community-based organization. It was essentially you know an agreement of DA had with a, a CBO. So I think, um, yeah, to spin those programs up is, is not easy, especially if you want to do it really well. But, you know, we can down the line figure out exactly the scope of the recommendation. We just want to stick to the, you know, create penal code section 1,187, then that's where we might end up. Gotcha. Um, the next bullet point is to evaluate existing trauma recovery, 
the trauma recovery grant, excuse me, trauma recovery center grant system. We didn't really dig into it because I kind of tried to steer us away from it actually during the conversation, but you might have picked up that there's some um, conflict over the way that the trauma recovery centers are funded two year versus the three year grants. My instinct is to stay out of the wicket, stay out of that. I, um, I think so too. I'm not sure what penal code connection, but. So I like, I mean, it seems like they're doing good work, but I don't know if this is something that we should stick our noses into. Okay, um, so, uh, something that's not on this bullet point, that, but it came up in this conversation that I was surprised to hear, I, don't, I was want to take the temperature of the committee, which was that there seemed to be some consensus that mere gun possession is being over, either overcharged or over punished um, as an enhancement or as illegal gun possession. I know that the that the case law is very broad on what counts as possessing a gun um, and use of a gun and armed for it. And I wondered if that was something that well, we- Mike, I think we, I think back when we dealt with, which was more than a year ago, maybe two years ago, enhancements, we found data that showed how many additional years were added to people's sentences who, because the say the gun was in the vehicle or that, but the, the gun had not been used. Yeah, and, and today they said 40% of people in car in CDCR have a gun. Uh, enhancement, you know, right. Part of the kit. I don't know if it's an enhancement or a substantive charge or what, but what I was surprised to hear was that there was consensus that the mere possession of a gun in itself, that some people thinking that, that that is being over, overly punished. Now it's one thing to use a gun and you know genuinely use a gun in the course of a of a crime. We're not talking about that. And I thought if there was opportunity, political opportunity, given how common it is, and how that there seems to be um, under appreciation that people possess guns genuinely for public for personal self-defense purposes. Um, I don't know. I thought that that, that was something that um, I, I would be interested in looking into. Yeah, I mean, I think we have that data, but uh, even independent of today's discussion. However, um, I think, again, Tom, we should look at the uh, history of bills around enhancements. I think every attempt to try to do some remedy of that has uh, has um, failed. But I could be. It, it, it's um, yeah, it's very complicated because, you know, our gun enhancements range from adding one year to creating a life sentence. So to kind of put them all in the same bucket, you, we lose a lot of nuance um, in the way that our uh crimes are set up is the gun is not an inherent element of it like it is in some other states where being armed is an element of the offense you added on later being an enhancement so you know i think this is the, one of the discussions we had when we looked at sentencing enhancement a few years ago like it's just a different way of setting up sort of how you do the math to get to a sentence at the end of the day what, what we've done though is created um this 1020 life gun enhancement that really I think has a disproportionate impact. But those are cases where you have to use the gun to get 10 years and then you have to cause injury to get 20, you have to cause really bad injury to get life. So it's um the gun enhancements that I think would make the most sense to look at are not the ones that are involved, you know, sort of innocent possession or simple possession or something like that. And 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 Rick, let me know if I'm wrong about this. Almost all of the gun possession offenses now are wobblers so could be charged as misdemeanors so it's it's tough to i think no would make sense as a as a next step there so i think it's sort of two issues do we look how, at the more extreme gun enhancements or do we or how you know, about in the definition of what possession of a gun is armed with a gun is use of a gun is is there room there you know there's like this constructive possession cases i mean right you hear the, you hear these, I gave you gave my friend a gun 10 years ago. And you know what, I don't know how common those cases are tr genuinely, but they, 
seems like there might be. I, I think that's the question is, uh, and unfortunately, it's interesting. I don't, I don't think we've been able to see any data about sort of like you were talking about the unloaded gun or the guns in the car or something like that. And I, I think it's going to be very hard to know because every time there is an edge case like that, that is the one that's going to sort of get appealed and generate the really bad decision. And that might be the one case out of a thousand that's anything like that because the incentives are there to, to push it. But the, right, the law around being armed with the gun is like, you know, if the gun was in your house and you're close to your house, that can, that might not be exactly right, but you don't actually have to physically, you know, have it in your hand to get a lot of these enhancements. But how often is that actually, you know, abused in that way i think is is challenging to know but we can try to gather some i've had enough cases on this armed is available for offenses or defensive right. use, and there's a lot of decisions about the availability that i think the legislature may reasonably want to weigh in on because courts have just run um pretty i think far with what that means so the legislature has uh prescribed punishments for and en enhancements for being armed with a right. firearm not defined what the hell that means and over the course of years maybe decades courts have expanded what armed means in ways that i think um might be opportunities to curtail that to kind of the original intent of the legislature to continue to come out gun crimes yeah and, you know I, I and i'm pretty sure the arm enhancement is the one that adds one year so it's oh. it's the it's the lower end of it and that was one of the original enhancements that was part of the determinant sentencing law in the 70s so we can go back and look at that and how about evolution illegal, over time just, just illegal possession of a firearm is that what's is that a wobbler already most of the time yeah, in most cases that's a that's a that's a wobbler, uh, and I think the the whole possession discussion is kind of what set up the recommendation for gun diversion. In that, there's a lot of people who are possessing guns, have no intention of using it for another offense. They're kind of living in a high crime area and and having it for self defense purposes. The idea is that for those individuals, you know, subjecting them to the entire criminal process and hanging a conviction on them is not effective. You should do a diversion for those for those individuals and then the separate issue is okay what about the people who are who have a gun and commit some other crime how are we handling that with enhancements sure anyway i, I think this is, should be looked i mean i do know that the case law is you know you being you're convicted mm -hmm. of a offense while being armed and because you have a gun for defensive use that just seems like kind of contradictory to, to me it says offensive or defensive use i think that you know maybe we stri strike the defensive use you we'll, know we'll take we'll take a we'll take a look at it piece of that all right moving on um the next recommendation is um improve the app's data integrity by allowing courts to determine a convicted person no longer possesses a firearm Right, so this is the uh, um, the DOJ says you have a firearm because you have a registered firearm, but you gave it to your uncle ten years ago. There was conversation about saying that well, maybe we take de testimony or have some sworn statement that says I, I I did give that to my uncle, so I don't have that. I don't know how big a problem this is. Didn't seem to be a ton of opposition to it. I don't feel strongly one way or another, unless it is a huge problem. I don't know if other people have thoughts about it. Well, I can try to set the context. So I, I agree in, in vacuum, I'd be like, what is this? But it, it came up almost everyone we spoke with mentioned this at some point. Um, and if you look at the folks who are in apps, um, a big chunk of them just have cases where the DOJ is like, we, we can't find the gun. We can't do anything else at this point. Um, and also apps is, you know, as there is this, a lot of discussion, there's a, always a lot of legislative action on uh, the prohibition and relinquishment in the last few years. And so this seemed like an area that would improve the system, probably isn't getting a lot of attention on its own, um, and is tied very strictly to the criminal conviction process. So it seems like a good, uh, you know, penal code revision to make. But yeah, it's not going to 
remake the whole system, but I think it would get rid of some of the junky cases so they could better prioritize which ones to focus on. I'd love to see, love to give it a, just a, even an anecdotal grasp of what number of um, cases you're talking about. More than I gave you? I mean, I, I, <laughs> that was pretty anecdotal already. I don't know right. what else there is to give. Well, <laughs> what what I took from that discussion was that, you know, there's been, there's a big obsession with apps in the legislature, but what, not only this discussion, but just in a, a observing that apps, that we spend a hell of a lot of money on apps and I'm not sure really what's the point. Because right. the, if we, again, we'd have to look, I mean, yeah, yeah, obviously a certain number of violent crimes with guns are done with legally owned guns, but the majority are not. And, mm -hmm. and our app system, it's certainly you, you can fall into it, you know, once you have felony independent of whether you're registered as a gun owner, but it's very much based on the registration of someone who illegally buys a gun and uh whatever i mean it just i uh i don't know if we want to uh put the effort in but it might be worth it to really um whether one of our external partners could really do some analysis as to what um benefit are the amount of money that we're spending on apps is actually bringing us is it you know how how many of the the, the guns related or retrieved or, or associated even with a person who has been a violent criminal um because we you know it's one of those things where we could direct the money elsewhere whether it's in in these uh violence intervention programs things that we know have worked like ceasefire or the office of neighborhood services those two are in my district so i'm very familiar with them you know that that again uh the, where we put our resources to have the most um, impact we the state of california uh, absolutely and that that's um you know, that's why i think we started the day with sort of this violence prevention in general regardless of where you got your gun from um uh and I and I and on the effectiveness and what sort of what has apps done? I know Steve uh, Steve Raphael has done research showing that you know their conclusion was that it did contribute to the drop in homicide that we started to see around the time it came online. So I I can ask him if he can sort of throw that into the mix when he's with us um, next time. So I think it's a great question. You know, apps seized I think around a thousand guns last year, and there were more than eight hundred thousand sold in that year alone. So. It is, you know, a drop in the in the bucket, but maybe it's the right bucket to be pulling things out of. I don't know if that's the right metaphor, uh, but it also does seem if, if if we know you have if we have a good reason to think you don't have a gun, and we said you're not supposed to have it, to ignore it is, um, you know, doesn't seem ideal either. But I think it's a great point, Senator. All right, the next recommendation is to. Um provide training and coordination for law enforcement organizations so they understand the firearm relinquishment requirements after conviction. And this kind of frustrated me a little bit like, we have to pass a law to tell them, to tell the prosecutors to follow the law. That's what we heard today from prosecutors <laughs> a little bit. You know, right right now, the punishment, if you don't turn in your form, so you get convicted, they give you a form saying, oh, do you have a gun or not? Check the box. If you don't turn that form in, the punishment is a $100 infraction, which the DA has to actually charge against you. And what we heard is no DA is actually doing that. So there's essentially no, um, if you don't comply, that's it. So uh, it does seem like there needs to be a little more of a a plan for what to do in this scenario. And this is what Julia Weber was talking about. And I think, you know, one reason we wanted to hear so much about the civil protective order process was there's been a lot of changes made there recently, including Senator Skinner's pending bill, and they seem to have been effective, but there doesn't seem to have been the same kind of attention in the criminal conviction context, which is, um, you know, there's a lot more criminal convictions every year than there, there are. And whether all those folks need to necessarily be prohibited to have, having a gun, you know, you write a bad check, you get a felony conviction, you can't have a gun anymore. I don't necessarily 
know if I see the immediate public safety connection there, but that's the law as it is. And that process could probably benefit from a little more attention like we've given the civil process. That was the idea of the recommendation anyway. Um, this may be too far field, but I'm sure we can get the data. I know probably Winterman has it, but the uh, majority of deaths related to a gun are, as far as I've seen, the day, are suicide and, and domestic violence. And those two are really, don't have anything to do with this, like once you have a conviction and relinquish your gun, right? So while we want to minimize gun violence, that is other type of crime, clearly, if we're really about trying to reduce deaths by guns, then our focus has got to be around, I think, how do we how do we um, create the conditions where people will utilize things like the DVRO, the domestic violence restraining order, and the other relinquishment orders, whether they're workplace, school, uh, you know, family like GVRO, what have you. Um, because what, it, as we heard, and what I learned in my deep dive, is that neither our law enforcement or our public know know about these and really know that they have it the, they're available to them it's probably not a penal code thing but yeah i don't i don't see a lot of fire and belly in this so but we certainly could in our in our end of year report have some discussion about what we learned, even if it doesn't have a recommendation related to uh, change of the penal code. I was going to say that the thing I don't love about this recommendation is it, it feels like the DAs came in and said, yeah, the law says we have to do this, but unless you basically bribe us to prioritize it better, we're not going to do it. Good point, Isaac. And that does, or, or we don't think it's important enough to be doing in lieu of the other things that we're supposed to be doing. So if you specifically tell us in a, you know, reimbursable state mandate that we must prioritize this, then we will prioritize. And that, that seems like something I don't want to give the DAs right now when they could be doing this personally. I it agree. Doesn't mean it's not good policy. It just feels like, you know, they have a choice here and they're making a choice. And there, there are, you know, DA associations and judicial counsel and others that are supposedly their responsibility to make sure that everybody knows what the laws are. The idea that they don't know what the laws are, it's tough. Um, I, I want to move on, but, I, you know, I don't know if this could ever be part of, you know, budget stuff is that, you know, in order to, is the condition of receiving budget money is that you have to do this. I mean, like, I don't know. Right. A whole that that's an interesting idea instead of you know a new thing that we then have to pay for make conditional resources and negative consequences they should be able to understand I, i'm more of a stick than a carrot person myself <laughs> of existing law it's existing law it's not like we're creating a new law and creating telling them to do something so like that's interesting uh to the extent that there is a recommendation that uh, comes around there i would love to to carry this on behalf of my favorite senator who's going to be leaving me <laughs> All right, moving on to asset forfeiture. A um, couple of recommendations here um, to expand the ability of um, the recipients of asset. First of all, the money was a lot less money actually than I thought. I learned something. You hear these horror stories about you know the police departments are just hoovering up billions of dollars, and I think a hundred million dollars a year in California is not as much as I would have guessed. Um, but to allow that to allow the money to go to victim services, everybody seems to think that that's a good idea. Right. Well, they may equally incentivize to collect assets if it's not going to them as if it's going as if it were. Oh, that's interesting. Well, they get to choose. So we're not saying we're not requiring it to go to. 
victim services, but we're allowing them to give it to the victim services. Maybe we say, maybe we choose a percentage, sort of like if you're in prison and you're paying restitution, you part of it goes to you and part of it goes to the victims. I think that's, that's, that's super interesting. <laughs> forcing them to use some of this asset for forfeiture money for victim services. <laughs> they would hate that and couldn't say it out loud. <laughs> that would be a good thing. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, and the bigger idea here too is, you know, of the money that's seized under state law, 65% goes to law enforcement. And then within that 15% is, you know, for drug and gang. And we would expand that to victims is, is where we're starting at. Another 10% goes to uh, district attorney's offices to essentially pay for the work they do to, forf you know, do all the legal work to forfeit the money. Uh, and then 24% goes to the general fund. Um, and I think that is earmarked for school security or something specific up to a certain point. And there's 1% that goes to uh, an environmental, I don't recall, but it's 1%. So um, those, those are the bigger percentages. Sorry. For the drug and gang activity, what's the percentage? Because I know right now the idea is just add it there so it's it's just an eligible use but what's the percentage for those two right there it, it's 15 percent of 65 so we may have to have steve do the math for us on that too it's you know it's something 8%. let's call it i don't know 10 percent or something <laughs> what, what about what about um half the money that goes to the police has to go to victim services instead <laughs> that, if that there's will... the expansion of it that's appropriate but i think we already heard and I can tell you from being budget chair in the past, that there, there is far less funds in the asset forfeiture account than the things that it has been committed to. Right. We're not talking about a huge amount of money to begin with. Right. Right. But what, of course, the what some of our speakers were speaking to is, is in a way, increasing, enabling them to get more of the, or, to get more of the assets of, say, the retail theft uh, rings and such. And, um, you know, if we were to go in that direction, one, I'd want to make sure that we were doing it carefully enough that we weren't, again, just uh, doing asset forfeiture to low-income people. But secondarily, then, you know, having it uh, go to victim compensation, because that's our other, our victim uh, funds are, we don't have adequate we don't have enough. I mean, you could just match the 15%. Say 15% of this is already set for um, drug and, and gang. F victims should be entitled to at least that much um, and just do a, a whole 15%. So you could also add it. I mean, the way it, it is most pragmatic, the way it's currently drafted in terms of just adding it in there. Uh, I think that's that could fly on consent. That could be carried bipartisanly. That's not a big deal. But I think... Uh, if you're meaningfully going to, you know, attempt to disrupt this conversation a little bit and force us to think about what we're doing with this money and whether we should have all of this money to begin with, I think um, that it, it might be more interesting to assign a a dedicated earmark to victim services. It's, so it's, the number the number is nine point seven percent of a hundred million dollars. So we're talking about nine million dollars, ten million dollars a year. Right? I don't think it's even that much. Gesture. What's that? I, I I think the hundred million is including federal money that we can't. That's right. Oh, so it's not even so, that. Right. I think it's about forty million. Let's say that is addressable right, so by the state legislature. Even less and less money. I'm, Gosh, it's a gesture. But, you know, but here is this is one thing we sort of talked around and, and didn't put in the memo, but you know. And this ties together a few things we've talked about. So part of Prop 47 money is to fund trauma recovery centers. It's 10% of the Prop 47 savings. As we saw today, it's about eight-ish, $9 million, I think, a year. Um, if that is going to be reduced, if this ballot initiative is successful, we're talking about sort of a roughly equivalent amount of money, um, this asset forfeiture discussion. And because TRCs already do have other funding sources, it would just be supplementing a little bit what what's there. It might, I don't know, it kind of falls together a little bit on when you do napkin math like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, and the money does fluctuate. Um, so it's, it's tough to, 
really know what to, to do with it. So the fact that it's 1% of sort of law enforcement budgets, you know, they can handle it if it goes down, but if it's 15% of somebody else's budget, anyway, I think I've made my point. <laughs> Why are the asset forfeiture numbers so low in California? Yeah, you know, as Mike said, it was surprising. When we looked into this, we were all fired up to find, you know, there's really big abuses and, you know, people are losing their houses and cars. And we just, we didn't find that. Maybe we didn't look hard enough, but I think um, a result of that is the work the legislature has done in recent years. Um, and, you know, we, so we tried to focus on the things that, um, how the money is used. That didn't seem to be something that's been focused on in a while. And some of these very obvious things like, you know, you shouldn't, take 50 bucks from somebody and then think they're going to go into court and challenge it. I mean, that just seems very unrealistic. It's essentially okay, a how many, like, big fraud that. cases. Like, are there big fraud cases in California, the way there are in the federal system where, you know, one asset forfeiture, it could be long and complicated, but it could yield a significant amount of money. Percent? I don't, I don't think so. All, all and all the money we're talking about is only from drug cases. Um, so there is the separate little RICO statute, which is what we're talking about for um, the organized retail theft and gun sales. And there's no data on how much money is seized there. But our sense is that it's almost nothing, or it's it's very small numbers. All of this stuff. I mean, I'm just going to sort of cut the cover. I mean, like the num the amount of money that we're talking about is so uh, it's beginning mm -hmm. to be not worth our right time. Well, I think it will, it'll, you know, the, the, the more we try to redirect it, the bigger a fight it becomes. And then it's a question of, you know, if we're talking about $15 million and getting every law enforcement organization against it, maybe <laughs> right. that's the calculation. To meet your original recommendation, as, as I mentioned earlier, incredibly thoughtful and pragmatic and, and likely could become, you know, policy and law. And I see, I see the yeah, thing. but policy and law that doesn't do anything. I mean, we that's all, not necessarily we all, we all, true. We all slap ourselves on the back for having done something for crime victims, which is. I guess you've never been in the legislature, Mike. That's you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the, but the um, yeah, have you have you met our colleagues? <laughs> the, I say that in total jest. Obviously, it's the end of a long day. Um, Absolutely. You know, and the other thing we found is the money that the 15% is used for is supporting like boys and girls clubs and community programs. So it's tough to even get motivated about taking some, you know, reshifting that money because, uh, you know, whether that does anything to prevent crime or whatever, but it, it's, it's, it's tough to um, find a very easy target. Even some of the law enforcement things we, people we spoke with said, you know, we use this money to buy helicopters that we also use for search and rescue during fire season. So it's, you know, there isn't like, in some other states, very uh, I'm obvious. Sure, I'm sure that's what they use it for. They, they use it to- They don't have enough money to buy a freaking helicopter. I don't know what the hell they- <laughs> and, and, and they save seniors who uh, are trapped Puppies. in homes Puppies. during urban heat. <laughs> that's exactly what they use it for. <laughs> all right. That's a flavor of the counter arguments. That's all I'm hoping to- yeah, No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I like the minimum, the next recommendation, by the way, Mr. Chair, um, but interesting, it seems like the DAs were hinting at, yeah, we like it too, if it's the lowest that's already in California. <laughs> is uh, 1500, you mentioned Minnesota in the recommendation, is that bigger than Minnesota? Are there multiple states that have set 1500? Is there some yeah. degree of national standard? I, I, so... The answer to that, I think, enjoy, I see you shaking your head. I think Minnesota is the only one that has a, a minimum. There are some states that don't have civil forfeiture. They require criminal conviction. And I suspect that that kind of acts as a minimum. But, you know, as far as the apples to apples, no. And, you know, obviously, I think a lot of DA's offices have minimums across the country. But good luck, you know, trying to find those. Um, and there is data that the Department of Justice puts out every year on every asset forfeiture. So you can see how many are each dollar value. And as I think we point out in the staff memo, there are a lot. Uh, every county is doing it at relatively small amounts. Maybe we take the 1500 adjusted for California's cost of living, and that's how we come up with the number or something. But there isn't a lot of uh, you know direct support in other state law. But I will say the fact that um, you know the representative from CDAA was in, you know, in principle, like the idea, I think, is, is a great starting place to talk about the policy. 
Oh, I, I agree. And I, I can see them sitting in the public safety committee right now saying that we don't have a problem with this in principle. We just think it should be 500 bucks. <laughs> Uh, which which would be would stop some seizures, but you know again whether you know it's not the right the most significant change, but would would be actually in some seizures. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and you said you know we we have the data that shows by now. I mean, we could literally do the math and see about how many cases under five hundred over the last year, several years, decade, whatever this uh, this could impact. Um, I'm sure there's a threshold that would make it uh, meaningful to the chair. There is, there is. I don't know what that number would be. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we sort of come to the end of a long day. We, you know, it's been another productive one. Thank you all, um, especially staff, for um, putting together another incredible. I, my, of I hate to interrupt. I don't think we've really talking about the expanding to other offenses I mean, we hinted at it. I don't know if, yeah i don't know if there's anything that hasn't been covered in there just wanted to make sure we, we covered that one you know senator skinner's point was we don't want it to be able to be abused so i think one way to do would be to put a minimum there that has to be met before you can do a seizure which we kind of have um in drug cases already we have different Okay. Uh, burdens of proof for different amounts. I don't know. It just know. seems like not. A, it seems like not a lot of money. It seems like we're really spending spending a lot of time thinking about this. It seems like with the retail theft, there are other ways to get at the money. What other ways? What I heard today was there wasn't another way. Well, the, 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 couldn't they have categorized it as something other than retail theft? Well, um, we. I think there we should ask um, the AG's retail theft task force because we didn't. Uh, you know, they weren't part of that discussion. I think it's worth that they may have a better insight. So, and they may have a suggestion if if this is important to address, they may have a suggestion on how to. Okay. We'll do. Great. Sorry to have cut to the chase preliminarily, yeah. but I do, but I, but, it is the end of a long day. It's a Friday. Yeah. Um, you guys have done great work again, yet again. Um, for any of the witnesses who are still maybe lingering, thank you all for your time. We learned a ton. I learned a ton. Um, and I think we're going to have a couple of good recommendations uh, coming out of this. So um, thank you all. Uh, we've come to the time for public comment. Um, for those listening on Zoom, please get in line to comment and select the raised hand function in Zoom. If you're calling in, hit star nine. Note that this meeting is being recorded, and if you make a public comment, your name and phone number may be displayed. If you're watching this meeting at a physical location, please let staff know. I don't think anybody's at a physical location. Uh, we'll take a minute now to see how many people want to comment, and based on that, I'll say how long each person has to comment. Um, please keep your comments relevant to the conversation that we had today. Um, and uh, obviously note that we accept public comment in writing and that comment can be me emailed to committee staff and is often the most uh, helpful and productive way um, of getting um, information to us. So I see two, two raised hands. Um, let's take 90 seconds for each. Um, Yolanda. Hello, committee and members. I'm Yolanda Navaretti. I'm a crime survivor, carceral reform advocate um, with Initiate Justice and many more. I wanted to bring some information that I learned from our county uh, district attorney Citizens Academy pertaining to the LED lights. Uh, we were instructed at our at our seminar that those new LED lights are all installed with cameras. So there's constant surveillance going on. So um, I didn't hear the DA saying that today. So I just wanted to bring it to your attention. And then um, as far as raising funds and getting stuff going, what about these election ads that are propagandas and false advertisement of false information when we've got statistics that you guys are giving that are showing that rates are lower, you know, crime rates are lower and everything. Why don't we start fighting those organizations that are doing that and giving that money to victim services? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Yolanda. I do think that we should, you know, uh, 
streetlight issue, you know, of course, we don't want to invite in invasions of privacy. And the other with regard to um, misinformation about crime, that precisely what we talked about, about a, uh, the committee taking a more of a leadership role in that area. So thank you for those thoughts. Um, the next person I see is Christine Palm, Mary Bum. It's, I'm sorry, it's cut off. I think you know who you are. Hi, can you hear me? We can now. Yeah, that's my full name. I'm. It's also Crispy. <laughs> it's, okay, hi Crispy. This is oh, why I go by Crispy. Hi Crispy. Hi. Um. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read comments from people incarcerated in California state prisons. First one's from Michael Singh, incarcerated at R.J. Donovan Correctional Facility. Currently, no avenue exists for LWAP youth offenders that incentivizes rehabilitation. Now, a recognized goal of CDCR. Perhaps interested parties, just attorney's office may reach a resolve for this dilemma, i.e. those with extensive documentation of rehabilitation coupled with at least 25 years incarcerated to act as an initiating barometer to recall. Then AB 600 utilized as a resentencing mechanism activated this way. Rehabilitation is rewarded despite not being required, thus showing achieved rehabilitation is recognized. A greater incentive newly incarcerated youth offenders, LWAPs, will participate in rehab efforts much earlier, knowing there is light at the end of the tunnel. This one's from Jasper Stallings at Valley State Prison. Hi, I'm Jasper Stallings, and I have a couple quick statements for Dr. Gina Castro-Rodriguez in regards to trauma-informed care at, <clears throat> at, recovery and center, at recovery centers. Do you realize that trauma affects everyone, and we all should be striving to better our community <clears throat> by the centers that you are currently using for trauma-informed care? I would invite you to check out Trauma Talks, and one thing that I hope for is that all the people involved take and utilize good mindfulness practices along with CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Dortel Williams, Mill Creek. Hello, fellow citizens. I was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole 34 years ago. I was 23 years old. I was a troubled student, <clears throat> told I wasn't college material by a counselor when I, <clears throat> when I sought help. Yeah. Now I am thriving in prison, earning a master's degree, mentorship after the fact, surfaced my potential. Our first response should be intervention, <clears throat> not incarceration. Even, even at $5,000 per child, it beats the $132,000 plus annually spent on thousands like me. Intervention is how we protect from victimization. For 50 years, our current policy only creates more victims, waste needed funds, and human potential. Thank you. Thank you for all the work that you guys are doing. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Crispy. Thank you for always paying attention to what we're doing. And please send our best to those who are listening also on the inside. Thank you, all the committee, staff, everybody, um, witnesses, people in the audience. Have a great weekend. I really appreciate it. You know how to reach us if you need to. Um, we're adjourned. Thank you. Everybody. <laughs>